Next, we would love to welcome Dr. Ann Partridge from Harvard. She will talk about pregnancy outcome and safety of interrupting therapy for women with endocrine responsive breast cancer, the initial results from the positive trial. Thank you, and it is uh, cool that I'm presenting right after baby Tam, because we will <laughs> talk about pregnancy outcome and safety of interrupting therapy for women with endocrine responsive breast cancer initial results from the positive trial, which I'm presenting on behalf of the Positive Consortium. And this study is led internationally by Olivia Pagani, who couldn't be here with us today. And the sponsor is the IBCSG, but it was really a worldwide um, effort led in part by the big around the world and alliance here in North America. So for background, we know that many young breast cancer survivors desire pregnancy. And despite retrospective evidence showing pregnancy after breast cancer does not clearly worsen disease outcomes, regardless of hormone receptor status, women are often discouraged. Further, a standard five to 10 years of endocrine therapy compromises conception in women with hormone receptor positive disease. Pregnancy after breast cancer and interruption of endocrine therapy to attempt pregnancy have not previously been studied prospectively. The positive trial was designed as a prospective single arm trial to address the question, is it safe from a breast cancer relapse perspective to temporarily interrupt endocrine therapy to attempt pregnancy? It was designed to enroll only women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer history. And it was designed with specific safety criteria, including a pre-subscribed duration of prior endocrine therapy and the specified timing of pregnancy attempt and resumption of endocrine therapy. The eligibility included premenopausal women wishing to become pregnant they had to be age 42 or younger at study entry, and it had taken at least 18 months and no more than 30 months of prior endocrine therapy for their history of stage one through three breast cancer. Prior adjuvant and uh, chemotherapy was allowed, as were um, assisted reproductive technologies. There was no clinical evidence of recurrence allowed on study entry. Here are the trial procedures depicted in the graphic at the bottom of the slide. There was a planned endocrine therapy interruption within one month of trial enrollment. The trial, the protocol uh, prescribed up to two years to attempt pregnancy, conceive if possible, deliver if pregnant, and breastfeed if desired, including beginning with a three month washout period. If no pregnancy was achieved by one year, a fertility assessment was strongly recommended. Endocrine therapy resumption was also strongly recommended either after a pregnancy or by two years if no pregnancy were achieved. And the plan was to complete five to 10 years as per patient preference and the risk of the patient and their decision with their doctor. Long-term follow-up, of course, is to be conducted. The primary endpoint is breast cancer-free interval, defined as time from enrollment to the first ipsilateral, local, regional, or contralateral invasive disease or distant recurrence. And you can see the secondary endpoints depicted on this slide, including pregnancy outcomes and distant relapse. The statistical considerations included a planned sample size of 500 women, and the primary analysis was planned after 1,600 patient years of follow-up with a predefined safety threshold of 46 or fewer breast cancer events considered safe. There were three interim analyses designed, as you can see specified here, to de declare a lack of safety or safety. In addition, we conducted, or we actually calculated a cohort from the soft and text trial of 1,499 patients, which were matched with specific criteria to the patients enrolled in the positive trial, the first 50% to use as an external control. 
bootstrap matching methods were used to compare positive versus that soft in text control group for disease outcomes. Today we present the primary analysis of breast cancer outcomes and secondary pregnancy and offspring outcomes. The trial enrolled from December 2014 to December 2019 at 116 centers across 20 countries on four continents. This truly was an international effort. The primary efficacy analysis population comprised 516 patients and secondary endpoint population uh, was 497. The median time from breast cancer diagnosis to enrollment was 29 months and median follow-up from enrollment, which on average was about two years from diagnosis, was 41 months or approximately just over three years. The key patient characteristics are listed on this slide, and they include a median age at enrollment of 37 years. 43% of patients were between 35 and, 4, and 39. 75% were nullips, had never had a prior birth. And 94% had stage one or stage two disease. Treatment patterns included a median duration of 23.4 months of endocrine therapy prior to enrollment, and the patients had been treated 42% with CIRM, presumably tamoxifen alone, and 52% had received ovarian function suppression, the majority also with a CIRM. 62% received adjuvant chemotherapy, and now let's turn to the outcomes. Here you can see that our safety threshold was not met. There were 44 events in terms of breast cancer relapse in the positive trial for a three-year breast cancer-free interval of 8.9%. The distant relapse represented approximately half of the events at 22 at 4.5%. Now you can see superimposed in the dashed lines the soft and text control cohort. And as should be obvious, I hope, there is no statistically significant difference between our control cohort and the positive cohort outcomes, both for all uh, events as well as distant events. As you might expect, the three-year events varied according to clinical and pathologic characteristics in the positive cohort, including by HER2 status, nodal status, tumor size, and tumor grade. And to further assess for an effect of pregnancy in the positive cohort, we compared women who became pregnant to women who did not become pregnant in both an 18-month landmark analysis as well as a time-dependent Cox modeling using univariable and multivariable uh, modeling. And for both of these analyses, there was no clear harm from a woman who became pregnant compared to a woman who didn't become pregnant uh, in the positive trial. Here are the pregnancy outcomes. 368, or 74% of the 497 women in the secondary endpoint population had at least one pregnancy. 70% 70 of them became pregnant within two years for a total of 570 pregnancies at the time of data lock. 317 had had at least one live birth, and that represented 64% of all women enrolled and 86% of those who became pregnant. You can see here that fortunately, uh, neonatal and stillbirths were very rare. However, 19% had at least one miscarriage, and 3% of women in the positive trial had at least one elective abortion. Delivery was predominantly vaginal, 66%, and pregnancy complications uh, happened in about 11% of pregnancies, and the most common were hypertension and preeclampsia in 3%, and diabetes in 2%. Let's look at the babies. Uh, there were 350 live births for the 317 women who had at least one live birth. 
335 singleton births and 15 sets of twins for 365 offspring. 62% of the 317 women reported birth breastfeeding after delivery. There were 92% who had not low birth weight, 8% had low birth weight, and as noted previously, relatively few birth defects, 2% did and 96% did not, and 2% were missing or unknown. We also looked at endocrine therapy adherence by doing a competing risk analysis for resumption of endocrine therapy. And you can see here the cumulative incidence is at 48 months of 8% of patients had a cancer recurrence or death before resuming endocrine therapy, 76% resumed endocrine therapy, and 15% had not yet resumed endocrine therapy. 79% of the women who were disease-free at two years after enrollment who had not yet resumed endocrine therapy reported continuing pursuit of pregnancy, active or recent pregnancy, or breastfeeding at the most recent follow-up, when of course um, resuming would have been contraindicated. So in conclusion, in positive, temporary interruption of endocrine therapy to attempt pregnancy among women who desire pregnancy does not impact short-term disease outcomes. 74% of women had at least one pregnancy, and most, 70%, had those pregnancies within two years. Birth defects were low at 2% and not clearly associated with treatment exposure. We plan to follow this cohort for at least a decade out to at least 2029 to monitor for endocrine therapy resumption and disease outcomes because, of course, in the setting of hormone receptor positive breast cancer, there is great concern about late recurrence. However, these data stress the need to incorporate patient-centered reproductive health care treatment and choices in the treatment and follow-up of our young women with breast cancer so that they can not only survive but thrive in their survivorship. So first, I'd like to thank the patients and their families. This was truly an altruistic endeavor on their parts because we know they could have gotten pregnant without their doctors. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank um, the cooperative groups, the collaborators, all of the investigators, and the all-important supporters for this academic endeavor. And finally, I would like to thank, and this talk and the whole study is dedicated to the memory of Professor Aaron Goldharsh, who, without whom this would not have been possible. Thank you. So there are several questions online asking if you were able to look at the percent of recurrence related to the time off endocrine therapy. So we looked at the, so there were, no, we have not looked exactly when the recurrences happened except in that competing, uh, the, the competing risk curve. So you can see the recurrences in there. Um, and there were, of course, 44, and they did occur kind of over time. In relation to exactly when people are off, they were off up to two years or a little more. So you can see that in there, but we haven't done further analyses of when exactly they happened with regard to whether or not a person became pregnant or not, except that landmark analysis. Super, and in person, microphone five. Uh, my, my name is Saj from JBCRG. We are attending this study, and it's a very great, great result, actually. May I, may I ask you about the result of a pregnant situation in, by country by country? Because ART circumstance or way of thinking is different between the country, each country. So do, do you have a data about how different between the country? 
So that's a really great question. We know that there were lots of differences about even the prior endocrine therapy by region and by country. We also know that endocrine, that uh, assisted reproductive uh, technologies were used at some point in the study by about 43% of women. We have not yet looked at that by country or region, but that's something we plan to look at in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I can see we have a lot more questions than we have time for. We'll take one more, and then I would hope uh, we have a great discussion that's coming up. I know that we have a great discussion coming up, and hopefully that will answer some additional ones. So microphone four for the last question. Matteo Lambertini from the University of Genova. Super congratulations and very important, huge academic effort. My question is related to the uh, washout period of tamoxifen. Uh, in, the, in the trial was three months, and when the trial was designed, indeed, this was the washout wash period recommended. Right now, the FDA recommends nine months. I'm not really sure why. My question is if you have looked or you are planning to look into uh, pregnancy outcomes according to the timing from tamoxifen termination to the conception. So thank you for your question. And, um, you know, we used a very conservative washout period from the standpoint of uh, levels of tamoxifen metabolites of three months. The half-life of tamoxifen is seven days, and one would expect, therefore, that at about 35 days it would be out of one system, and we said three months. Now, there are also theoretical concerns about tissue level of some of the metabolites of tamoxifen and other hormonal agents. And the FDA concern is really based on animal studies and not based on people studies. And so we will, however, look at this in the positive trial and look at, of course, the outcomes of the progeny in, in more granularity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Partridge.